Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to The Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome everyone to uh, another episode of The Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, named the fastest growing film festival in California by The Hollywood Reporter. And the Scotland International Festival of Cinema, which finished up its very successful inaugural year this past April in Peebles, Scotland. It was a lot of fun, and my team and I look forward to being back in Scotland every spring now that it's off the ground and going strong. Uh, We're podcasting today, as usual, from Lunatopia Studios at Chateau Esteban in the beautiful village of Idlewild, California. Just a two-hour drive from Los Angeles, but a world away at just under 6,000 feet, high above Mount San Jacinto and overlooking the great Coachella Valley. So we have a very special episode lined up today, and it's something I've wanted to do for a while now, but I wanted to wait until I could get both of my guests on at the same time to talk about something very close to my heart, and that's the journeys and experiences of uh, Latino filmmakers working in both mainstream film and television, but also very active in the independent film world, and these these two gentlemen fit that description very well. Um, if you, you look at me, my friends and everyone else, you see a very... Celtic European looking white guy but the fact is uh, my mom's people were a mix of uh, not only European blood but uh, uh, Castilian Spanish and Northern Mexican and though I'm proud of my father's Welsh Irish roots I'm equally proud of my Latino and native heritage as well and as a filmmaker and screenwriter I personally find that having both that uh, that Celtic and that native blood makes me a pretty good storyteller as both of these diverse cultures are known as storytelling and oral tradition people, which lends itself perfectly to filmmaking. So uh, let me welcome in these two friends of mine who are not only amazing actors, and I I should know as I've directed them both in in a... um, more than one film project, Um, but they're both seasoned directors and storytellers as well and move between the Hollywood world and the independent film world with ease. So first let me welcome in for the second trip, uh, his second trip to the podcast, a man you'll know from his work uh, in the Tyler Perry series, The Haves and Have Nots, as well as his many film roles, including that of uh, Vasquez in The Hangover Part 3, and uh, his latest pretty cool venture as Virilio Gonzalez in Gaslit, in which he stars with Julia Roberts and Sean Penn. Calling in from his home in Los Angeles, actor and director Oscar Torre. Oscar, how are you, buddy? Doing great, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I always like having you on the show. Um, uh, you were on once with your wife as well, so you, this is actually kind of your third trip, maybe, I think. But oh, That's true. That's true. We're yeah. veterans. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I first met you when you came to an audition that my producers and I held in West Hollywood in this very cool home of one of the uh, casting directors. Uh, I believe it was for my film uh, Le- uh, Legacy, which ironically... Legacy. <laughs> that's right. Ironically, today's the 12th anniversary of that film's World wide distribution through Osiris Entertainment. So that's that's kind of ironic. Oscar, do you remember you remember that audition pretty well? I believe it was like 2009. I clearly remember that audition. It was the only time I've ever auditioned right by the swimming pool. <laughs> That's right. It was the auditions were held right next to a swimming pool. That was a that was a pretty cool day, and I got to meet Oscar, and we became buddies, and uh, worked on that film, and then uh, yeah, it's just been going on ever since. Uh, also calling in from his home in the greater Los Angeles area, men whom you'd recognize from, among other things, his work on the uh, BET Network original series Family Business, and. Something that excited me, his recent turn on one of my all-time favorite television shows, Better Call Saul, which I just loved seeing him on that show. My friend, Manny Martinez-Hernandez. Manny, welcome to the podcast, brother. Hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Man, Manny and I met on one of my weekend acting boot camps here in Idlewild, I believe, and from that I cast him in my friend Vertical, or my film Vertical, which... Uh, which uh, now has distribution uh, with the Roku channel, and, and it's moving to uh, Amazon Prime very soon. I think that's the that's how we met. Is that right, Manny? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. It is. Yeah. I, 
I have to tell my listeners that I've always had a sort of a love-hate relationship with both these guys. And let me let me qualify that. The love <laughs> the love part is that as a director, these guys as actors are a dream to work with. They always bring something special to the table that elevates a production, unlike most others that I've worked with. But uh, the, just a pleasure to to direct. The hate part is. Well, you're both married to the most beautiful women on the planet. How the hell did you manage that? <laughs> and Manny, your wife Norma is the sweetest person and such a gorgeous girl, absolutely stunning. And and Oscar's married to actress Judy too from Yellowstone and Nashville and other great shows. And and Judy's also a beautiful person inside and out. So you guys, in my mind, you're like lottery winners. I think. <laughs> yeah i think so too. well mine is a little blind because she's with me <laughs> oh okay so <laughs> I, I won't ask you to perjure yourself um uh, i want to start by asking you both we'll start with oscar i i know about a bit about your history of course as we've been friends for so long but can you give us uh, give my listeners a brief rundown on where you're from originally and how you started your journey as an actor and ultimately a writer and director <clears throat> Um, born and raised in Miami, Florida. Uh, my parents immigrated from Cuba when they were uh, teenagers. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I, I started my career in, in Miami at a time where they were doing a little bit of indie film. Right after Miami Vice, mm -hmm. in the early 90s, they were doing a little bit of indie film and stuff. And I was blessed enough to be able to work in those. And... Um, and then I, I had the opportunity to star in a film called Libertad and another one called Suicide Blonde. And with those two films, I decided to move to L.A. Mm -hmm. to take advantage of that. So I moved out of here 25 years ago Wow. to L.A. And, um, and then I started directing. Uh, I had done a lot of, I had done quite a bit of TV, TV work and film. Um, and I started directing once I met my wife, Trudy, too. Uh, she had written a great screenplay, and we were looking for a director. We kept interviewing different directors. And it was a tricky, it was a tricky film that in the wrong hands could, could not work. Mm -hmm. um, and the more time I spent with it, the more I, I realized, you know what, I could direct this. And I had already started getting the directing bug, wanting to direct. I, I see guys like... Uh, Clint Eastwood, who's, well, he's now in his 90s, but back then, you know, mm -hmm. he's already up there in age. And I'm like, he's still directing, and he gets to cast himself in films. And, I, and I'm like, you know, this gives me longevity in the business mm -hmm. and gives me some control that we don't have. Uh, any actor, it doesn't matter if you're Latino, black, white. The, right. We don't have any control mm -hmm. unless you're Tom Cruise or, or something sure. like that. And he still needs to get those. 300 million, whatever it takes to make his movies. Mm -hmm. So even then, there's no control. Um, so that's what motivated me to start directing. And then I decided to direct the, the and, and my wife gave me the opportunity to direct. It was her, it was her call uh, to direct her film that she had written and was going to star in, uh, Pretty Rosebud. And that's, that's how I started directing. Right, Pretty Rosebud. Came out of necessity, yeah. Yeah, Pretty Rosebud was the first film that I that I remember seeing that you uh, with you as a director. That was that's a, it's a great film. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it played it played at the Idlewild Festival. It did, did really yeah. Really well. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I remember going to Hollywood for one of the premieres, and um, I, you, and uh, Chudy had asked me to come up on stage and and kind of introduce you guys to the audience, and that was a great thrill for me. But it's just such a, right. such a good movie. That was in the theatrical release. Yeah, that yeah, we the... we we got distribution, mm -hmm. and we had a one week theatrical release in in L.A., mm -hmm. which you often do that, so you the movie get, can get reviewed by the major uh, uh, papers, right. And magazines and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you were kind enough to drive down here and go up on stage and introduce us. And because the film started its run, its festival run at Idlewild. Right. Yeah. I think you premiered at Idlewild. That's right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big thrill. I I really appreciated that. Um, and we're going to get into another film of yours, a, a film you you guys, you and your wife both had just finished that was also. Uh, at the Idlewild Festival and the Scotland Festival, I believe. And um, so we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but first, I want to bring uh, Manny. I'd, I'd like to get your story as well. But before I do, I read a quote from you once that I'll never forget. Uh, you said, if you're not working toward reaching your dreams, 
you're working to help someone else reach theirs. And every filmmaker will understand <laughs> that. I know it touched me right off, right away as such a good connection with one's goals, etc. I remember working on uh, my first big budget film called Cosmic Radio. And uh, there was one of the crew members, I think he was a grip or something, came up to me and he says, man, I've been watching you. I want to be where you're at, man, what you're doing. I want to be the boss. And I go, well... The, one of the decisions I made was not to come out of film school and start working on other people's movies as grips and electricians. Those are great, great people working on crews. But I made the decision to starve for a bit and just hold out for my own thing, which is directing and writing. And and Manny, that kind of inspired me. So have those have those <laughs> words sort of guided your own journey through life as an actor and filmmaker? And and tell us where you grew up and how your your childhood experiences guided your decision to become a filmmaker. And, and what were your inspirations starting out? Yeah, um, sure. I um, yeah, I guess that that came across to me at a young age, younger age, that idea of watching my family, you know, work their asses off and mm -hmm. um, starting their own business and, and realizing that no matter how hard you work, um, yeah, you might get a bonus. You might end up, you could always still get fired. You could always get laid <laughs> off. You could always, you could always, you know, end up with nothing. And even if you start your own business, you could still end up with nothing. Mm -hmm. So w what are you really doing, right? Uh, for me, is I didn't start getting involved in entertainment until way later in my life mm -hmm. um actually in the last 15 20 years really um i didn't really know what i wanted to do growing up i i was playing sports uh i went to you know i never went to college i tried it wasn't for me um and i was just working and working and getting lost in the mix i grew up in upland california well i was born in tijuana mexico mm -hmm. my family moved moved me here when i was a kid around three or four years old so I grew up in the States. Right. I would spend my summers in Mexico with my family. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I kind of got, uh, I grew up kind of getting lost in the mix of who I was, where I belonged, what I was going to do with myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, got, I was just kind of lost. And one of my friends took me to an acting class um, in 2002, somewhere around there. His name is Rob Silvera. And um, I walked into a class and Within like, I can honestly say within less than a minute, I knew what I wanted to do with my life, mm. but I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how. Watching all the actors uh, re like playing roles or rehearsing or doing all these crazy exercises, I had no idea what they were doing or had never been exposed to something like that. Mm. I grew up on uh, on uh, on team sports, right? And but it was never fulfilling enough for me, I guess. And when I went to that class, I found something that I felt that I wanted to do for myself as an independent person. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started, really, not knowing anything about anything, you know, mm -hmm. about what I wanted to do in my life. And somehow I ended up in acting class and went from there. It's funny how I acting, never stopped going. <laughs> acting just seems to grab you quick, doesn't it? It's like, it's yeah. like weird. It's just, it's one of those things. And there's not very many that it just, you could not be thinking about filmmaking or acting or especially directing. And then all the, it just grabs you fast. It's funny. Huh? Yeah. It grabbed me really fast. Mm -hmm. I did not know. I mean, I just, did, I never stopped going back. Right. Um, and it pretty much helped find, helped me identify who I was as a, as a as a man mm -hmm. and, and like what i want to do with my life to give me direction give me purpose um mm -hmm. it pretty much i feel like it saved my life in a way because i was wow. that messed up right and um yeah 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 get so the way the way it can give you purpose you know it's amazing but then how did you uh, the acting thing was one thing but how did you really realize that hey i want to i want to get behind the camera as well i want to i want to make films i want to tell stories as you know as, aside from just acting in stories I guess for me, it started with the idea that I was the, the roles that I was getting, the auditions I was getting, the mm -hmm. kind of uh, the gardener roles, the, the cholo roles, the mm -hmm. cook in the kitchen, the one that doesn't speak Spanish or doesn't speak English, you know, and all these ideas of, of uh, there's nothing wrong with these roles that are needed for to tell stories, but mm -hmm. being limited to those opportunities, I got kind of tired of it. And so I started writing. Mm -hmm. um, not knowing how, didn't take any classes, just kind of picked up scripts and started copying them, and in a way, the format way anyway, and then just started writing and writing, and mm -hmm. I, I just love the whole, I love the whole business of it. The, right. I love both sides, and I like telling stories, and 
I, I just was really intrigued by being able to tell a story that I wanted to tell with my point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where, where I got started. It's funny what you're talking about, you know, gardener roles and things like that. I think a lot of Asian people from the beginning have felt that same way. And it's when once you become a director and especially a writer director, you guys will both attest to this. It's just like it opens you up to going, wow, I like you said, those characters are important, but I can write those characters, but also have these other more fully fleshed out characters, you know, and uh and stereotypes, we'll get into that in a minute, but it is weird how um, I think a lot of more of uh, the minority filmmakers become writer-directors because they go, I want more than this. And this is not, you know, the people I grew up with aren't just a bunch of gardeners and cooks. <laughs> Actually, there's a, yeah. lot, a lot of crap going on in the world. And uh, uh, so let's get into the reason I had you guys on today in the first place was to talk about this uh, the subject of latino filmmakers not so much in hollywood world but in the independent film world which we all deal in and what what my festival my film festivals are all all about they're not big glitz fests for uh multi-trillion dollar hollywood movies to show off ours is about giving voice to um to new filmmakers and we we all know the big names in hollywood uh, the robert rodriguez's and alfonso Corones and the patricia cardoso's guillermo de toro of course but as the owner of two film festivals, I notice I've been noticing a great uptick in lat- Latino directors and screenwriters in the independent world, and it's really exciting to see. And for a time, I was I was contemplating an awards category just for Latino filmmakers, but something happened with our Women in Film Awards at the Idaho Festival, the Mary Austin Awards. After a time. Because when we started off the festival, it was probably only 10% of the filmmakers were women, the directors. And after a time, it it, start, it just felt a bit condescending to have a Women in Film Awards. And I asked women filmmakers that I know what they thought about all of this. And they all said the same thing. The, the, the amount of films coming into our film festivals have shifted to the point where a solid 50% of our submitted films come from female directors. And it seems like the same with Latino film directors. Having a having a film awards for black film categories or Latino or Asian or even Native American films. Uh, there's so many great films coming to us from such a, I hate to use this word, it's so overused, but a diverse background of filmmakers. I'd just rather let the whole, I'd rather let someone's work speak for itself <laughs> instead of categorizing everything. And that's not to say I'm against film festivals that solely scream films from one heritage, heritage or uh, of artists or another, because I like, you know, I like going to, I've been to a couple of Latino film fests and, uh, but for my festivals, I just like to celebrate films and filmmakers and leave it leave it at that. And if anything, that has elevated our entire festival integrity in the long run because um, just letting people come in, bring their work, and then just letting it stand head to head, it's it just to me is the better way to go with everything. But I don't know. That was kind of a ramble there. But there's still a a question of your own experiences while actually getting your projects off the ground and what changes you guys have seen in just, let's say, the past five or six years. Manny, let's start with you. What what changes for the better have you experienced in your career overall, and where do you feel there still needs to be improvement, say, in the in the Hollywood system or even in independent film? Um, I, I, man, I feel that it, there's technology has opened the floodgates for everyone, Mm -hmm. has leveled the playing field and has given opportunity to anyone that really wants to do it can figure out how to get something done, Mm -hmm. whether it's your phone, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, lower price uh, cameras, the quality is there. Mm -hmm. The availability to do what you want to do is there for everyone who really, really wants to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest game changer in the industry, uh, especially for independent film. You Mm -hmm. can bust out a film uh, with, with limited budgets. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the number one thing. The second thing I feel that's happened is that people are starting to tell stories where, where myself, I'm with you. I, I don't like the I don't like the categories. Yeah. Um I'm I'm just I, I've never played the Ranger games. I've never been good at that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I just want to be known as a filmmaker. I don't want right. to be in a subcategory. I want to be in the top, you know, the top film mm-hmm. that's being shown. Like if you could click on Netflix I want to be on the top line. I don't want to be in the sub- subcategory. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's changing. Uh, I think people are starting to realize, hey, 
a film is a film and it's about the story about the journey about the characters that are involved and the point of view and that's what it's really about that's what i want to get to and that's where i agree with you 100 percent in in that idea yeah it's fun what you're talking about the technology the thing is I can go out right now with my brand new iPhone 13 Pro Max and I could shoot a feature film or even a short film if I wanted to. But if I suck, if the story sucks, the editing sucks, mm-hmm. the acting it's still a bad movie <laughs> no matter what. So that comes back to, yeah, the technology is there, but that doesn't make, make people filmmakers. What make pe- makes people filmmakers is a passion for it, an ability to not just go to film school. A lot of great filmmakers have never gone to film school, but it the if you're doing it, if you're if you're working your passion in a real life situation and shooting movies, you're eventually going to get to the point where you're pretty damn good. So I remember early on with technology, people saying, "Oh yeah, everybody's going to be able to make a film now, and it's going to suck." And it's going to well, you can look at a movie and and tell if it's if the filmmaker is knows what he's doing or not, you know. But uh, Oscar, the yeah. same question: what what have you noticed in both the plus and minus columns in your career as far as working as um, I think your career now has gotten to the point, though, buddy, where y- you're you're just a you're an actor, and anybody that would say, "Oh, you know, Oscar Torre, a Latino actor," uh, it's like it's almost like it's cool when you do like an interview and people want to talk about that. But I never look at anybody as, "Oh, Manny or Oscar, they're Latino actors." To me, you guys are actors, and but do you find that a lot that there's still that kind of wanting to pigeonhole you as an actor in some cases? Um. Yes, yes, and and I've soon at the beginning you got to take every work, every sure. job you can get because mm-hmm. you got to pay the bills, you know, and and you want to get break in and you want to get known and you want casting directors to know you. The thing that I've done is I've tried, I've tried not to repeat myself in in roles mm-hmm. or, or try to bring something different to each role, even they might seem similar, mm-hmm. and I've turned to work down over the years. That's interesting. Um, because it gets to a point. The, the plus is you get you get to start being known. The negative is they want to pigeonhole you and mm-hmm. say, okay, he's he's a Latin. They want to put you a, a label. Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm an actor. I'm an actor, and I can play any role that that's within you know within within my range, and it's not limited to Latinos. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I've done. I've tried doing as a filmmaker. Is I, I don't do uh, to this point it doesn't mean that I won't do at some point if I moved, but I haven't done a film that's a Latino movie. I've mm-hmm. done movies, I've directed movies, mm-hmm. and they've all. And if you look at my cast, it's very diverse the cast, but it's a role that any any anybody can play it. it he could be Latino, he could be white, he could be Asian in the most part unless it's very, something very specific to where this person comes from. Right. Because that's the world that I live. I grew up in Miami um, where there's a mix of everything. Um, I come to LA. I see a mix of everything. I go to a hospital and the doctor is Latino and the nurse is Filipina. And the, and the guy who's running the, the guy who's checking you in is white. And the, you get a mix of, of everything mm-hmm. in the, so that's I look at the world, and I go, okay, I want, I want it to look, how I see the world, that I'm in. Um, but I don't necessarily think, oh, it's got to be a Latino story, mm-hmm. or that I have to cast a Latino in this role, or white, or black, or I, I don't, I don't think that mm-hmm. way. And I think that's always the the challenge, in 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 Hollywood. And then maybe I'm going off the subject a little bit, no, but I think really. it's in part is because we don't have minorities in power. So right. the person who decides, there's still, we've made a lot of progress. But if you think of like in this case, we're talking about Latinos. If you think about a Latino, there's just a number of few Latinos only who are starring in major films. Mm-hmm. They tend to be the sidekick, the best friend, the, because the people in charge, the ones that are greenlighting the projects, the ones that are still thinking, oh, we need a white actor. Mm-hmm. That that's that's how that's how they're thinking. And it's until you get people in power who are able to green light films and see the world kind of like how I see it, that there's a mixture of everything. And this role that his name is Bob, Bob could be anything. Mm-hmm. 
a Marie can be anything. She can be white. She can be Indian. She can be black. She can be Latina. She can be, it doesn't have unless it's very specific. And and we're not we're still not there yet. I think it's getting better. It's gotten better. Um, but we're not there yet. Often, and I, I've been blessed enough, and maybe because how I look, that I don't fit a specific. At the times I'm like, oh, he's not Latino enough. What they mean is that I don't look Mexican. Their yeah. idea of Mexico, because by the way, if you go to Mexico, you see all types of Mexicans. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it's yeah. it's the stereotype of what people think all oh, this they should look like. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I've been at times that I've gone in for a role and been cast, and then my name, my character's name is Johnny, for example. I get cast, and then when I start working, I, I get a rewrite. And the character's name now is Hector. They changed the name <laughs> right. because they cast me. Or somebody somebody in power goes, no, this guy's Latino. Um, the sad part about all of that, I know exactly where you're going. The sad part is that a lot of times it's people who they think... Hollywood is like this. I like to call it the, the woke supremacists. It's always white people who think that, that what they're doing is for the better good. You know, I'm going to be more politically correct if I take this Latino actor and I give him the name of Hector. They really think that that's the way to go. I don't get it. I don't I don't. I remember uh, we were in my film we mentioned earlier that I did. I had uh, two very prominent Native American actors and we were invited to screen at Sundance through the uh, Native American Film Studies program at the Institute at the Sundance Institute. And the, the letter I got from the from the people in the Institute was very cool. They said, oh, we like the fact that you took Native actors and you put them in traditional roles. Um, in other words, they were saying they didn't have war paint on and this wasn't a Western. One of them played a sheriff. The other one was a DJ. And I went, why is that so unique? Why what I just did is so fabulous? It's like. I just cast them in a role. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. And then they were good at, they were, I mean, Wes Studi is a, is an Oscar winner now. And I cast him because I loved Wes Studi, not because, you know, this was some kind of, I needed natives to play warriors or something stupid. And I'm just always blown away by the fact that people really, they think their hearts are in the right place. But I, I, I mean, what, what are you talking about? I don't get it. And I had a, I had a, um, casting director write me a very offensive letter telling me that she thought and she probably sent this to a bunch of different directors and producers but she thought I needed to be more diverse in my casting and she was going to send me a roster of people she was thinking of pushing for films and she sent me all black actors and actresses and I went well how is that diverse first of all I wrote her back and said you've never watched any of my films because my films are full of all kinds of different people all walks of life and uh but second of all well if you're so into diversity how come you've you've sent me six black actors to look at instead of where are the latino actors where are the asian actors so so it's a i think people think their hearts are in the right place but they're really kind of it just kind of baffles me i don't know but um let's talk about as actors and in staying sort of on the stereotype thing have you, you so you're saying you Oscar you you think there's still a perpetuation in the biz toward a, a lot of stereotypes and we look back at some of the old films and cartoons that were less than flattering but even today do you feel some of those old tired per- perceptions in characters do they come from the screenwriters originally or do you really feel that producers like you just said Oscar they change something just because they cast you is that pretty much what you're seeing a lot of still well, I, I think it's a combination. It's hard to pinpoint and say, you know, where it's coming from because often I don't know mm-hmm. who made the decision. But mm-hmm. it, it, I see the lead roles, and I'm like, I read a script, and I'm like, I can't play that role. Mm-hmm. I, you know, why am I not auditioning for that role? Or people who, let's say not me, mm-hmm. people who look like me, people who are Latinos, you know, why can't? They audition for that role, but no, I, I see who they cast, and I see who was up for it, and I see who came close to getting, and I see, and they all look the same. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, they can't see past what they know, and in part is because just like, and I think, and I'm not, I don't think it's coming from, I don't think it's racism per se. That like, oh, they're racist. Mm-hmm. I, I, I tend not to think that way, honestly. Mm-hmm. I think most people are not racist. Um, I think it comes from, this is the world I know. 
I grew up, maybe I grew up around people that look like me. Uh, I went to places that people look like me. I went to school with people that look like me. So I write for people who look like me, which is great. But then they can't see past people that look like me. Right. Man. And I think that's the issue. And sometimes it comes, maybe it's not the screenwriter. Maybe it comes from the producer, the person who's putting the money. And it's still that, that mentality of like, we can't put a lead who's Latino, who's black, or who, uh, who's Native American, because I don't think uh, Iowa's going to buy this. So I don't think, uh, thinking yeah. that way. And the truth is, Hollywood is a machine that makes stars. Mm -hmm. They, if you put somebody in a lead role, and you give them a good role, not a crappy, badly written role, because that movie's going to fail regardless of who you put as a lead. So you have Russell Crowe movies that are going straight to to uh, to cable or whatever, mm -hmm. and he's a fantastic actor. But that project was not well written. Therefore, not even Russell Crowe could save that project or Christian Bale. or. Sure. So it's if you give the, an actor a good actor, regardless of how he looks, if you give him a good role, mm -hmm. well-written role, and you, you're open-minded, you're going to see new people coming up who, who you're going to, you're going to go, Oh, this guy's fantastic. Because I, I know actors who are fantastic and are not really getting the opportunities they can get or actors who are now older. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know so-and-so I know him as an actor. This guy was great. This guy could have been a star. But he never got that shot. He never got to audition for those roles. Yeah. It almost seems that there's, if you take An Antonio Banderas, who, um, or, or, um, uh, any actor like that who's more has a European Spanish feel to him. It seems like Hollywood's more open um, to to casting them in something different. But let's talk about people who are who are what we call Mexicans nowadays, or you know what we've always called Mexicans, are really um, a sort of a um, an amazing mixture of two very killer cultures, two amazing cultures. But but. It doesn't seem like casting in, like you said, Netflix is, it so much doesn't think about, let's put a guy who looks more like a traditional somebody who we would think of as a Mexican in a lead role. If we're going to put a Latino, let's pick somebody from Spain. And and it's great. Some of those actors I just love, you know, but it it does seem that there's kind of, even now there's just this sort of inability to look past, if not I don't know if it's a cultural thing or not. I'm not sure where I'm going with this other than I noticed something very strange that they'll cast a Latino character with somebody who's more has more of a European vibe to him much easier than they will um like uh And by the way, by the way, a white guy from Texas mm -hmm. knows more about the Latino culture that's, than the guy from Spain. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um. Well, who? What's it? It's slipping my mind now. Who was the actor? One of the Javier leads? Bardem. Yeah, Javier Bardem. He was so great in No Country for Old Men, but oh, he's a fantastic actor. That's the. That's the. Doesn't matter. That's my exactly. point. Is yeah. if you can think past, doesn't matter if he's a great actor and he sells you the role. Doesn't matter where he's from. Yeah. It's funny. It's just. It just seems to me that they're now. It's getting more, more. The argument's getting more diluted. I think, and I don't know how to explain that other than to say, while people are trying to make things better and and end stereotype uh, stereotyping in Hollywood, it's just they're not sure how to go about it. So they it seems like they just uh, convolute it even more. But anyway, we can move on from that. I know I want to talk to Manny about something that's uh, Manny, you and I have always talked about the educational part of uh, filmmaking and you've always been open to being very um, making yourself available to teach other people about filmmaking, especially younger people. Um, what, how big, uh, uh, how big of a give back do you find in your life that's necessary for you to be happy to, to make sure that people around you are learning about film and, and, and taking your vast experience and put it in, into practical work? I feel like more than anything, it comes to when people talk about representation mm -hmm. and representation matters and all these things, a lot of that really has to do with education and the idea that if you, you can see a job 
I grew up watching television and films like everyone else, but I never saw myself in them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was never. I grew up as a as a blue collar family. Mm-hmm. Uh, you what you work for, you get right. But there's always this measure of of uh, materialism with it. So if you work eight hours a day, you get this much money. If you work twenty years, you get this compensation. Blah. blah. Like there's there's always this this thing, time and trade off, right? But the arts have never were never really presented to me as an opportunity to to live as a career, mm-hmm. right, per se. And um, I think that giving back is like showing people something that you're doing that is really not on paper as a as as a career. Like when you take those tests in schools of what are you going to be when you grow up, the careers that we've chosen really aren't on those forms, right. whether it's behind the scenes, whether it's gripper, camera people, electricians, those are all like fantastic jobs and careers, but they're not really presented to our communities. So I think it's bringing people into the environment and showing them what is possible and then have them have allowing them to see the different positions that are available. And then they can kind of gather their own way that way. You know, um, I, I, no one taught me anything about film and television. I, I kind of had to learn myself and mm-hmm. I've, just kind of been tagging along um and just being able to show people what i do is it's hard to explain it really like i I don't because you're just kind of doing your thing and if they want to do it they'll do it too but being able to see a successful person doing something that you didn't ever think that you were able to do or even qualify for and you're right you don't have to go to a film school Mm -hmm. um it's great if you can it's an advantage for sure but the possibility to learn on YouTube, though, there's there's classes everywhere. There's things you can do, workshops. There's people you can mentor with. There's so, there's so many opportunities that are available. You just have to be able to know they're there. Yeah, it's funny because I, you guys are probably the same as me. I never realized it, but even as a kid, I was studying film. I would get up in the middle of the night on a school night, set my alarm to get up and watch a Sergio Leone movie. Because back before there was, you know, Netflix and everything, <laughs> and uh, not everything was available to you on tape or anything. You had to, if a movie was playing at a certain, or like Shane, my favorite Western would be on at 2 a.m., I'd get up and watch it. And I didn't realize I was studying film, but nowhere in my junior high or high school curriculum was film ever mentioned. It just wasn't there. It's getting better now. But I think Manny's right, especially in certain communities. It, nobody even knows that's an option. Nobody even tells you, hey, what? What about filmmaking? Um, it may be better now. I don't know what happens in high schools now, but I know back in my day, nobody even mentioned that. And I think, I think Manny, I've just watched you, and it's not that you sit down and, okay, kids, we're making a film today, and I'm going to teach you how to do it. It's more that you give of your time. You don't mind somebody asking you questions while you're working. And I think that's um, that's sort of, I've noticed, is your give back. You, you are... You're patient with people, and I think that's a pretty cool thing. So congrats on that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I promised both you guys I wouldn't keep you forever. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but um, I know oh. you're both busy, but if you could uh, uh, tell us what projects you're working on now that you can talk about or what film or TV roles are coming down the road. Um, and, Oscar, if you'd start, tell us about the film we briefly touched on uh, earlier, your latest uh, film that you did with your wife, Judy, too. Um just a man and a woman. Uh, just a man, just a man and a woman is. Uh, it's a film that was inspired, in a way. I used to. I started. I used to be a therapist. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I went to school for. Which, by the way, was the best acting school I ever went to, um, mm-hmm. because it was real life. Mm-hmm. You see people. You know. You, you don't see black and white. You see the gray areas. Right. And that's always been the the stories that I've been interested in. Maybe because of the influence of working at a mental hospital. Mm. Um, but the, it, it came from two stories that, that I heard there. Um, so I wrote this story about a man and a woman who meet once a week in a hotel room. And it, it's, it's an affair of some kind. Um, but then there's a couple twists in the story without giving anything away. Um, and it was inspired by, by, by stories I had heard. Um, and that right now it's uh, playing at a film festival in London. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to play at the 
next at the Sholo Film Festival. But to this point, he's played over 20-something film festivals uh, all around the world. Right. And um, it was a film that I shot with an iPhone. Looks I shot great. It, with the iPhone it 10. looks so good, uh, man. Uh, looks, nobody yeah. knows that I shot it with an iPhone unless you're a DP. <laughs> I've shown it to a, a couple of friends who were really established directors, mm -hmm. and they had no idea what I shot it with. Yeah. Because they're looking at the story. Like you said initially, the key is a story. And talking about kids, and what I tell young people all the time, you're living at the best time right now because with the technology, everybody has a phone. Mm -hmm. You can work on your craft. When I was coming up, you needed a camera, and you didn't, right. you, you didn't want to shoot video because it looked horrible. So it had to be film, and film was super expensive. Right. And everything about film was expensive. So it was much difficult, but much more difficult. But now with a phone, you can tell stories. As an actor, I tell actors all the time, you can put yourself on tape, do a little scene, do write a monologue, write about something you know. It doesn't have to be good. Mm -hmm. But just write it, put it on tape, put it on YouTube, put it on Vimeo, you put it on social media, and you never know. <laughs> you might get seen by the right people. That's right. If, you, if your work is good. Yeah. So you have more control than what we had coming up. We had and nothing. That's where, <laughs> yeah, no, we had nothing. We had nothing. <laughs> so that's that's the uh, as a filmmaker that's what I did and I have a film that just came out uh, this weekend this past weekend called Seventh in the Union mm -hmm. it's an Amazon original film and I play one of the leads uh, with Omar Aparro, Edie Ganim, uh, Greg Daniel, uh, Felipe Spice, a great cast, um, and again that's a diverse cast. Right. If you look at people in the cast, a diverse cast. Tony Nardolio directed it up-and-coming director who was fantastic. Um, and that's out right now. So, yeah, trying to stay busy. And congrats, editing a feature that I directed also, and I wrote. Congrats also, real quick, before I forget, on your the film uh, Gaslit that you did with Julia Roberts and Sean Penn. Um, the TV series on Stars. The series, on Stars yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. So, yeah, everything you're doing, it's just what I what I like about both you guys is you both just keep doing it. I think that's a, what you said. It's just a young filmmaker. Go out and just shoot anything and get it out there. So, And, uh, Manny, you're, you've got some stuff brewing right now, I I, I know. Yeah, I, I have a, I actually have a couple of features that we've, uh, we've pitched around, and we're trying to get a couple of casts to sign on. And once we get those on, then um, funding comes through. Like, if, you know, it's that chain reaction. You kind of sit and wait. And, right. When someone says yes, and you can go to the next stage. Um, but yeah, that's what um, both of those. Uh, I, one of them I co-wrote with my with my partners, Marco Parra, and the other one I wrote by myself. Um, one's a comedy, a holiday comedy, and one's like uh, a little bit more of a thriller. Are you directing um, either yeah. of these? Yeah, acting oh. and directing them both. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. that's the goal for me. And mm -hmm. for me, I'm the kind of person that I'm I'm a director that directs the stuff that I do. I'm mm -hmm. not really looking at taking on other people's work and right. then directing it. Right. I kind of like to focus on my own thing. And then I also have a comic book that I've developed and I'm trying to um, almost, it's, it's, a, it's being, uh, it's already written. It's being drawn right now. Um, yeah. So I got some projects working and just waiting for some funding like everybody else. Like everybody else. <laughs> Else. <laughs> and congrats you again, know? bud, on your on your turn on uh, on Better Call Saul. I love that oh, yeah, show that was great so too. much. Yeah, that... I was thrilled yeah. to see you on that show. You were saying you were perfect for that. Um, yeah, that was really really fun. Yeah, and, and being directed by you know me hanging out with Vince uh, over fourteen Vince hours. Gilligan, yeah, is... that's a big thing. Yeah. And Michael awesome. Mondo, the guy you, you know, that he's, yeah, he's Michael, one of my yeah. favorite actors right now. And to see you in scenes with him is just, that was great. I love that. So, yeah, it was really fun. It was great. Yeah, I got a couple more coming out that I really can't say anything until mm -hmm. they come out. Um, but that's sometime towards the end of the year. And uh, yeah, just like Oscar said, just auditioning and just, you know, keep my head down and I just shoot forward and trying to work. Awesome. Well, as I said earlier, I've worked with both you guys on a couple projects, and I'm really looking forward to in the future being able to work with you guys. So I'm glad I'm one of the guys still left who can who can get you guys to walk away from your your projects for a minute and give me a little bit of time i really appreciate you both um okay that's gonna wrap it up for this episode of the steven savage show on the savage podcasting network and uh i want to thank everyone uh, for the word of mouth that you put out there which has had this podcast growing week by week um in listeners from around the world we really appreciate you so 
All right, for Oscar Torrey and Manny Martinez Hernandez, I want to say thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. And thanks, guys. Thank you, Savage. Thanks for having us, Stephen. Thank you. you. All right, bye bye. Bye.